Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to uh, the last this year of our series of lectures on changing Islam in uh, West Africa. Uh, we have had a variety of lectures on Morocco, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal uh, in this series, and we are looking forward today to uh, one more. Um, this has been a very interdisciplinary series of lectures, um, and uh, it's been a great opportunity for us to bring in scholars working on uh, various parts of West Africa and a variety of different topics. So uh, today I am uh, happy to uh, welcome Beverly Mack, and I will uh, turn the mic over to Jennifer Yanko, who is the director of uh, WARA, the West African Research Association. Uh, I'm Tim Longman, the director of the African Studies Center here, and we are happy to be co-sponsoring this series with WARA. So, Jennifer. Thank you, Tim. Uh, well, it's a real, real pleasure today to welcome Professor Beverly Mack. Um, any of us who have uh, studied Hausa uh, know of Beverly Mack. Her reputation certainly precedes her. Um, she is a professor of African Studies in the Department of African and American Studies at the University of Kansas. And she is also a professor of Religious Studies. And today she will be speaking on um, African uh, roots of American Islam. She holds a PhD in um, African literature from the University of Wisconsin Madison, where it's a hotbed of Hausaists at the time, um, and has done extensive field research uh, in Hausa land, particularly in Kano. Um, and has also done work in Nigeria, uh, in Morocco. But uh, what she's going to be focusing on today, I think, has largely to do with the research that she's conducted in Kano, which is now spread out throughout the world. Um, she has written a number of books on the subject, which she will show you. Um, an early one was House of Women in the 20th Century. But what she's going to be talking to us about today um, is a House of scholar, a woman scholar in the 19th century, uh, Nana Asma'u, and the ways in which her legacy continues to shape Islam in the 20th, 21st century, still in the 20th century, mm -hmm. um, in the United States, among other places in the world. So um, I'm going to be brief. Um, Professor Mack has many, many honors uh, to her name. Um, but I want to leave the time for us to actually hear what she's come and to speak about and what we've waited for a long time. I want to also recognize uh, Mark Liam Bruni from WBUR, who is recording this, and Alex Zito, who is video recording. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thanks, uh, Tim, and, and all of you for inviting me. And thanks to all of you for showing up today. I'm so sorry about the delay um, yesterday. Don't fly. Don't fly. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. It's being recorded. Mark, you can. <laughs> um, so, let's begin. Um, going to sort of go back and forth between what I want to make sure I say to you and things that I want to show you. So let me just begin by saying Winston Churchill said that the farther back you look in history, the farther into the future you can see. And, and this talk is sort of one of those back to the future talks. So a good idea knows no historical limits. In the 19th century, a Muslim Sufi woman scholar in what is now northern Nigeria established a cadre of women extension teachers of other secluded women. The teachers were known as the Yantaru in Hausa, literally the, the collective, those who've come together. The Yantaru members were girls from about age 10 to early teens and women over 45, leaving at home those who had um, young children to care for. Um, these women who were at home caring for their children were um, 
were taught by the Yantaro. The Yantaro were taught by their leaders called the Jajis. Uh, and um, Jaji is one of those strange words that has no plural, so we put the American uh, English S on the end of it. A Jaji would regularly lead a group of Yantaro members to visit scholar Nana Asma'ul Nana Asma'ul bin Tosna Danforio, whose dates are 1793 to 1864. She was a 19th century scholar, poet, and teacher. So they would visit her in her home in northwestern Nigeria. They resided there to study with her um, while they learned the classical poetry that she wrote that constituted their lessons. And once they learned these poems and their meanings, the Yantara's task was to return out to the villages to carry this knowledge to secluded rural, rural women there. So this was a very efficient plan for the spread of knowledge, which sometimes involved literacy, but it always involved the pursuit of knowledge. Now, over a century later, a continent away and light years beyond the technologies of Asma'u's time, American women in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, thought Asma'u's plan for education was a good idea for them as well. This time, the texts flew through the air, disseminated through a web access, I guess that's through the air, the wires, um, with women teachers unpacking them through both web-based and person-to-person -person teaching sessions. So at the turn of the 21st century, American Yantaro communities were being established throughout this country based in Hartford and Houston, Los Angeles, San Diego, and Pittsburgh, where they functioned. And uh, for the most part, all of them are still functioning as women-based centers for the pursuit of education and the production of charitable activities in keeping with the essential foundational features <coughs> of Islam to pursue knowledge. Now, on the one hand, the modern development of Yantara organizations is quite remarkable. On the other hand, it is very much just in keeping with the tradition of women's education and charitable, charitable work that has been inherent in Islam since the seventh century. While the West often holds a misconception of Muslim women as oppressed and subordinated, Muslim communities here and throughout the rest of the world take for granted the inclusion of women in traditional education and social welfare activities as part of their Islamic-based worldviews. Muslim women regularly note Quranic support for their equitable treatment, especially in regard to the pursuit of knowledge. They emphasize that the Prophet Muhammad was supportive of and benefited from the involvement of his wives and other women in the Islamic community in educational contexts and also on the battlefield. The American Yantara movement is one of many examples of Muslim women's continual involvement in self-motivated activities in which women assume their right to pursue education and to enjoy respectful treatment in the community. It is the obligation of every Muslim to seek knowledge. In the seventh century, the Prophet Muhammad cited God's statement in his Hadith Qudsi, I was a hidden treasure, God said, so I created the universe that I might be known. On the presumption that the universe is God made manifest, Muslims are advised to seek knowledge unto China in the effort to advance on the path toward knowledge of God. Modern day Yantara women pursue knowledge in the same way that groups of Muslim women have done since the seventh century, meeting in study groups to discuss Quranic passages, to explain current events, to debate politics, and deal with personal concerns. Their activities reflect those of Muslim women in other countries where they meet in informal study groups on a regular basis for the purpose of discussing all these same matters. So.